Let me welcome Kirk Bresnicker from HP, who will be presenting on UEFI and Linux. One note, we will have a QA session later on. Um, I will walk around the mic, so just show up so I walk the mic around. Okay, so welcome Kirk, and let's begin. Thank you. So today we'll be talking about uh, UEFI and Linux uh, uh, platform uh, interface advancements and collaboration. Really want to give you guys, uh, if you're not familiar with um, with UEFI, uh, introduction to the uh, it's introduction to the technology. We'll go over uh, some history, some timelines, how we got to this place. Uh, give you some updates on the current state of the specifications, the testing regimes, uh, and ACPI. Talk about open source developments related to UEFI. Uh, talk about um, some of the challenges that we've had uh, in uh, in driving this technology out to market. And finally, have a call to action. You know, what can you do? What can we all do to participate uh, and make this uh, uh, the most effective technology uh, implementation as we all can collectively? So as far as what is UEFI Forum and its organization, as far as the umbrella organization, um, it has uh, a group of board directors. There are 11 promoters. They're shown on the, uh, on the logo thing there in, in, the, uh, in the big font. Um, but underneath that, uh, we have um, officers. Mark Dorn from Intel is the president. Uh, Dong Wei from HP, uh, who normally would be giving this talk, but is out at Stanford doing a a very important install of his son as a freshman over at the, at the university, uh, but he will be here on Wednesday, uh, is, the, is the CEO. We have the secretary, uh, Jeff Bozen, Bobson from Inside, and Bill, Bill Klung from Lenovo is the treasurer. But underneath that, we have 250 other organizations that are all participating and are members of, um, of the UEFI forum. And anyone who's a member, can work on any of these working groups. We uh, periodically spawn new working groups as they are necessary, and each of those working groups, in turn, has sub-teams. So you can see underneath the specifications, sub-team of security, uh, configuration, network, sh the shell, uh, the arm binding sub-team. So these are all brought together. They, um, anyone can participate. Uh, as they then go up, they come up and become specifications that are then published. Uh, while there is a uh, vote uh, mechanism that is possible for the 11 promoters to decide on any particular technical aspect of a specification, at this point, we've never had to invoke the vote. Everything has always been uh, uh, universally acknowledged and uh, unanimous as far as the decisions of what goes in the spec and what goes out. So. If you want to be able to participate, um, you uh, can join the, um, join the forum, either join uh, via um, your business sponsor, or you can individually join as well. So it gets a very fairly open and uh, easy to participate in mechanism if you do want to influence the specifications. That's wrong section. So this is sort of the timeline. How did we get here? Back in 1995, uh, Intel and HP needed a new firmware environment and architecture, boot architecture, uh, to get beyond the PCAT BIOS uh, for their uh, joint Itanium work. Uh, it was interesting because at the time, uh, some people up in Redmond were sure that Itanium needed to boot Windows 95. It was critically important. Uh, and some of us tried to see beyond that. And then, uh, in particular, Dong Wei on my staff pushed hard for a new, a new uh, platform interface architecture. So we created EFI along with some others in the industry uh, and also made it processor agnostic. So at the time, it was both Itanium as well as Intel uh, Xeon x86. Um, 2004, uh, tianocore.org, the open source EFI community was launched. UEFI forum uh, became, the U was added as um, AMD uh, was, and the 64-bit uh, extensions were added. Uh, UEFI is in 2009 was extended to the ARM uh, ARCH32. Uh, I thought it was interesting, uh, you know, one of the things in Jim's uh, kickoff speech this morning uh, that I thought um, he could also highlight as a critical 
uh, a critical industry change that is driving uh, the acceptance of open source in Linux is ARM is now the majority ISA shipped in the world. And I think that is another one of these generational transition points that we're seeing. And, and I think that's why it's great that oh, so over the last uh, four years, we've been working hard to extend UFI as a technology for platform interfaces to the ARM architectures as well. 2008, though, uh, Windows uh, 8 was one of those tipping point events that drove uh, UFI to a ubiquitous adoption in the PC uh, desktop environment and for Windows. Uh, now we have, in 2013, we have 250 members. Uh, we are extending to ARM AR64. Um, ACPI.next, we'll have a, a slide on that in a second. Uh, but we're also having today, uh, Wednesday, we'll have the first ever plug fest for Linux, sponsored by the Linux Foundation and UEFI Forum. That we've had these for several years to begin to test out interoperability of platform interface to I.O. card systems. Uh, and it's a great way for everyone to really be able to test that plug and play mentality. In terms of current updates, uh, UEFI 2.4 was released back in July. The most important highlight of that was the ARM AR64 binding. But you can see we go, do have released updates in um, many of the other subsystems, uh, adapter information protocol, uh, a capsule delivery mechanism to deliver uh, firmware, uh, disk I.O. 2 to support asynchronous I.O. and supporting NVM express devices. Um, in the platform interface, uh, which is the lower level, uh, if we remember what UEFI and this looks like, we have the platform interfaces, that's what talks to the hardware, and then we have UEFI, that's what you, the OS uh, and application coders code to that level instead. But as far as underneath in the platform interfaces, the big thing was adding I squared C bus protocol into support for the platform interfaces. You know, it's ubiquitous control mechanism used in lots of SOCs, all these different little devices out there. So it's important to have native support for I squared C in the platform interface. Uh, and NVM Express, uh, disk info, GUID, and the PCI enumeration uh, complete GUID as well. So working on all of these things continuously. In terms of test updates and plug fest, again, See the card on the right here? Plugfest. We had a plugfest in Taipei hosted by uh, AMI back in March. We had the UEFI Summer Plugfest up uh, in Redmond uh, hosted by Microsoft. And here we are later this week on Wednesday. Uh, we'll have our first ever uh, Linux focused Plugfest. So Canonical, HP, Intel, uh, Microsoft, Red Hat, and the UEFI Forum along with the Linux Foundation are sponsoring uh, this Plugfest. Uh, and you can actually go there, and I think, I believe it's open to everyone who's here. You can go in and see the stuff and, and see how people are doing, kick the tires. Um, in terms of the STT, which is the self-certification test, um, you know, we don't have, like Windows has their Wickle and their logo kinds of things. We don't have the same thing inside of uh, UEFI. We do have the self-certification test, test that, so that you can tell and test out your implementation. Uh, one of the things we'll, we'll talk about today is there's the specifications that specify what some behaviors, but then there's a lot of implementation details about how you actually want to implement this. And I think that's one of these, uh, one of the nuances and why it's great to have a collaborative community development environment because there are going to be some practices that we'll want to uh, definitely give out uh, tip of the hats to and, and wag the finger at some other people for some of uh, the implementation details they've done. Not necessarily anything that's in the spec, but we want to make sure we keep those things separate in our minds. Um, but uh, the standards compliance tests, they, gen they run essentially one cycle behind. So we can see that while we, in we introduced the 2.4 UEFI specs in July, the 2.3 test came out in July as well. So they tar target compliance with the prior generation. Um, they are, uh, it's a collective effort. People are contributing their test cases, contributing into the SDT. Um, we have uh, Intel and ARM uh, were the major contributors into the test cases, and there's some interfaces that are not co covered. So this is uh, certainly an opportunity. If you, uh, if you would like to join that testing uh, working group, I think they're always looking for people to contribute uh, into those tests. 
Um, the 2.4 will uh, target compliance against what was released back in July, and its goal is to be released uh, July of next year. And new members are certainly welcome. So ACPI, uh, this is a curiously blank slide, but um, you know we have the ACPI, the tables for describing power, RAS feature, control. Uh, you know, currently it's managed by uh, a group of five companies, and the bylaws that they set up were were really kind of limiting. They uh, allowed them to sort of generate a specification as necessary and then only do bug fixes unless they wanted to come together and generate the new specification. Uh, you know, as, as an industry, ACPI.x, we need to find a home for that. Uh, and so that's where, uh, you know, we look to something like UEFI where we have an, a much more open process where lots of people can join, everyone can contribute. Uh, and so uh, while it doesn't say it's on the slide, um, that's something that we're looking to do is to try and move ACPI from that small little cadre of companies that have been controlling it uh, and make it a much more open and collaborative process. So stay tuned to, to this blank slide and see if we can get something moving here before too long. In terms of open source UEFI development, uh, here you can see the, uh, the SourceForge page for, uh, for Tiano Core. Uh, Tiano Core EDK2, TianoCore.org, all points to here. Uh, it's a reference and implementation uh, for UEFI and the uh, platform interface uh, specifications. So again, we, the only thing that UEFI produces are specifications. This is, you know, here's the spec for the, the methods and the behaviors of the system. Everything else is an implementation detail. And there certainly is a lot of detail in there. And that's why the TianoCore.org reference specification implementation was put out there. Uh, it's got a BSD license. It's hosted on Source for, SourceForge under TianoCore.org. Uh, it supports uh, virtual environments, uh, NT, OVMF. Uh, it supports AR64 uh, and the AR64 base FDP. Uh, and then you can see the, the link in there. And uh, it also supports several reference boards, um, the OMAP, the Beagle board is a very popular one, ARM RealView, ARM uh, Virtual Express, and new in the x86 side, uh, Minnow board. Uh, so Minnow board, if you're not familiar with it, is an open design. Um, it's open from the hardware respects. You can go and download the CAD files and you know, implement it. You can buy them. Uh, Intel had uh, their IDF was this earlier this week. Uh, right now, if you go to the Minnow board and you click on the firmware link, it takes you to TianoCore.org, which is just the general purpose, um, you know, reference implementation. Uh, I believe when they had the Minnow board um, presentation at IDF this week, they said they'd have the source trees out uh, for the Minnow board within the month. So go back to MinnowBoard.org there. Uh, in a couple weeks and see if they have something beyond just the straightforward corner to uh, the TianoCore.org page. Linux on x64, um, the distributions are supporting UEFI boot um, and uh, UEFI secure boot via the UEFI uh, certificate authority. Um, Fedora starting with 18, Ubuntu starting with 12.10, uh, OpenSUSE starting with 12.13. Uh, Linux Foundation has certainly been a key part of this, and um, there on uh, Greg uh, has some great blog entries. Uh, if you just want to get started, you want to sign some things, get things going, he's got some great, um, great uh, blog entries there to walk you through the process. What does it take for me to uh, generate the generate the certificates, to sign the images, to get them in to walk through what does it take for my platform to uh, get my keys into the database to move between the different UEFI modes on my uh, particular uh, hardware. And we'll talk a little bit about that because that's, again, one of those implementation details. The spec says you have to have methods to enroll keys, to disenroll keys, to move between different modes of, um, of having the platform sealed up or open. 
but how you do those things are all implementation details that are left to the individual um, firmware uh, implementer. And that's one of these things where the plug quests are great because you'll get to see how uh, other people are doing it. And frankly, it's great for some firmware developers to see how the other guys are doing it better. Uh, and that's another good thing about the plug fest, uh, and certainly something we encourage people to really get in there and try and do things and post your results. And uh, the best way for the firmware designers, I know this is true at HP, uh, the best way for us to get them to do, uh, do the right thing is show them when they're broken and to walk them through and say, this is what I did. I would have assumed I could do this and this and this, and it failed. Why did it fail? Uh, and just be able to give them that, that straightforward feedback about what they need to do to improve. That's the one. The, so that's, yeah, that, yeah. As hosted by Microsoft. So uh, Linaro, uh, Linux uh, on ARM not-for-profit organization. Uh, and this actually has several branches of it. It has um, the Linaro Enterprise Group is the one that I know we've been involved with a little bit there. Uh, but they have been recommending UEFI as the preferred uh, boot model for ARM uh, V8 servers. Uh, so we have the leg group, and you can see the, the pointers there. Um, we're experimenting on uh, one or more physical platforms, uh, the ARM Virtual Express we mentioned earlier, the Panda board, uh, some Samsung devices supporting KVM, uh, and enable um, the UEFI uh, self-compliant tests to run on ARM systems. So that's one of the things that the, the uh, leg group is doing. Um, and they're also um, talking and uh, advocating for ACPI as the preferred runtime interface uh, for ARM V8 systems. Uh, and uh, you see they, there's their recommendations about how RAS features, power features, control features should be surfaced in these platforms uh, for consumption by the higher level software. Uh, and again, you know, what we're advocating for is a more open ACPI hosting environment where more people can get involved uh, and give feedback and generate the next generation of ACPI specifications that would include uh, better support for these platforms. So on to the challenges. Uh, and we've already talked about this a little bit, but there's the difference between standard, standardization and the balance between standardized and differentiated. You know, everyone wants standards to make life easy, to enable plug and play, but also everyone wants their thing to look a little bit better than the every other guy's thing. Uh, and that's one of the changes, challenges we have with UFI. Again, it's the only specification. Everything else is an implementation, uh, is, is reserved to the implementer to make their decision. Uh, UFI intends to support a very wide range of platforms, all the way from embedded up through enterprise. And really, we're already seeing that. Uh, you know, we, uh, at, even at HP, we have our largest, uh, our largest enterprise Superdome uh, platforms. Uh, are all running UEFI as our laser jet scanners. So for us, it does go uh, from, from, from a deep embedded application uh, all the way up through enterprise servers. And part of the benefit of that is that we actually have firmware engineers who are checking in modules that are used across all those devices, all of our, all of our um, a lot of our uh, personal system devices, our printing systems, scanning systems, and then uh, storage systems, uh, even some of our network equipment, and then certainly all of our enterprise servers. So it has the breadth, the capacity to operate across that entire range. Uh, it standardizes the platform interfaces um, for interoperability rather than the implementation. Uh, and we standardizes the human interface infrastructure. So we standardize the infrastructure of how the events and user interface devices come together. How you as an implementer, if you're a firmware engineer at a, at a, a device uh, manufacturing company, how you decide to implement those is again uh, reserved up to you. The UEFI shell is a little bit of an exception. That started out as not being specified, um, but people realized, no, you really do need to know some baseline of shell commands uh, that can be implemented that everyone can count on. Uh, and that's really because you need to be able to write shell utilities, shell scripts, 
the shell is a way, uh, one way for uh, value add software to very quickly implemented and delivered onto a platform. Uh, and so that's why the specifications were extended to include the shell. But everything else, you know, when you, when you power up and you see that some of the new personal devices have those nice, pretty, uh, high resolution graphics with touch, with mouse, and everything else, uh, although it's, it's amusing, you can tell where they stopped and where they said, this is 90% of the world and there's 10% because you have these beautiful screens until you say, I want to do a, an alternate boot. And then boom, you drop back into 1989 with yellow letters on a blue screen and you're hitting the arrow keys to move around and type and things. But it is something that is happening. Uh, richer user interfaces in the pre-boot environment, um, which is, uh, actually interesting because sometimes that preview boot environment now only lasts like five seconds. And again, one of these standardization things. What is the key you hit to interrupt a pre-boot uh, sequence on a laptop? Well, you can hit F8, you can hit F10, you can hit escape on HP equipment. Uh, and frankly, you only see that little message nowadays for about a second and a half. And if you bought, you know, over at, you know, go to Costco and you buy a PC and you unpack it and you turn it on and you blink and you miss that, all of a sudden you're at a Microsoft Windows click-through EULA uh, screen that has a choice of yes or turn off. And, you know, those aren't a very satisfying set of choices. A great choice would have been, why don't we power back down to that U, uh, UEFI setup screen? Uh, that would have been, and that's what we asked for. It didn't quite make it into uh, to their decisions. But, you know, those are some examples of the things that, again, we want to make sure that uh, if we encounter things like that, that we're voicing that, that we're saying, okay, you know what, I just bought your equipment and it was a pain to be able to add my second boot screen or my second boot device and, and make this a dual boot device because of X, Y, Z. And I know that's the feedback we give to our designers inside of, um, inside of HP, and, and Dong Wei, I know he's, he's coming to the plug fest with about uh, two dozen different distros on live boot USB sticks, because he just wants to go around and say, okay, show me, show me the step. I got my camera, I want to videotape this and post it so everyone can see, because sometimes it's, it's complicated and it doesn't need to be. There's nothing in the specification that says, you must hide an alternate boot thing down below some other hidden menu. It just says you must have multiple boot support, and it works really hard to get that in there. If it's obfuscated, that was a decision uh, or a non-decision by the implementer, not part of the specification. So user interface device, you know, boot options. Um, again, this is what we were just talking about. Uh, it's very flexible in multi-boot environments. Um, and we provide the EDK that pianocore.org provides a baseline uh, boot device selection with multi-boot, uh, multi, uh, multi-OS boot support. Uh, and, but again, this depends on the vendor. Uh, and some of them are hiding some of that stuff. Some of them are, are not doing it as well as others. Uh, so, you know, again, that's what we want to get, you know, the, the, the power of users, the powers of reviews of, uh, of social media. If you see something you don't like, make sure you let them know. Um, system uh, feature management. Uh, the HII provides that human infrastructure, interface inter infrastructure, and vendors are very creative. I've seen some beautiful designs. I don't know if you have. Um, uh, not only on, um, not only on laptops, but on um, motherboards uh, with with very nice interfaces for uh, plug and play motherboards and hobbyist motherboards to walk you through setting up all the things, and uh, they're pretty neat. Uh, and some people are really getting creative and really raising the bar on configuration and management in the pre-boot environments. And I think that's one of those things we certainly want to applaud uh, and encourage vendors. Uh, so, but the, the truth is that there is no standard presentation of these things. So that's, that's just going to be one of those areas that we've decided to allow and encourage differentiation. Secure boots. This is one everyone's always interested in. Um, UEFI, actually, it will go out on Wednesday, so you're getting a little preview. Um, they just put together uh, a white paper, uh, UEFI Secure Boot in Modern Computing uh, Security Solutions, and it talks about implementations, talks about what's in the specification, 
and also talks about what's not in the specification, what's left to the implementation, uh, implementation details. Uh, but the bottom line is root, uh, rootkit attacks are real. Uh, UFI secure boot is one way to protect against some of those uh, attacks. Uh, and as of right now, at least, uh, no one has claimed or demonstrated attacks uh, that can cir circumvent the UFI secure boot on a system where it is properly implemented and enabled. And again, this comes back to implementation. There's the specifications, and then have you done everything? You know, I know I've seen some, um, seen some uh, attacks that were based on things like, I'm going to go through and I'm going to do the secure boot, but if something fails, then I'll drop back to some BIOS compatibility mode and then just boot things anyway. And that then opens the door. Where what you probably should have done is say, oh, if this fails, why don't you prompt the user? Why don't you uh, do this? So I think that's just one of those, you know, again, implementation details, not in the specification. Um, but it's very, uh, it is a, we believe it is a useful optional feature for UEFI to have uh, and physically print users can and turn it off on general purpose x86, x86 systems. And again, I, I think we we'll always want to encourage if, you know, if you have a CD, a piece of hardware where they've taken that choice away from you, then I always believe in the, the power of the purse. Don't buy it and let everyone know why you didn't buy it. You know, that's the best, uh, I think, most effective way uh, to get the point across. As far as the user interface, um, you know, again, we've, we've already touched on this. It's, uh, it's not standardized. And I, I, frankly, I don't think it's going to be. People have made their decisions about which key they want to do to inter interrupt the pre-boot sequence. Uh, and that's uh, an amazingly, because we have more than one key at HP, uh, it's amazingly difficult to get things away from people. You know, if they are used to that one, then they're going to keep in that one. But uh, it's, uh, it's still... Uh, is still something that we all need to talk about. And in terms of um, other things that are challenges, nomenclature is not standardized as far as what, uh, the, what we're talking about in terms of keys and which keys. Setup mode, user mode, custom mode is one that Microsoft uh, added. And those are the differences between a system that comes with the secure boot uh, on uh, from the factory with the keys that are, that are installed. Um, some vendors like us will provide things like, okay, you can go from this mode, or you can then open it up. You can install your own keys. You can remove keys. Now, sometimes that's done with uh, pre-boot uh, tools in the pre-boot uh, environment, but there's also um, OS tools that can be used to enroll keys, to de-enroll keys. Uh, I think that's an open question uh, about which one might be better. Um, there's also implementation decision about what happens after I've installed a key. Can I then seal the system back up and say, okay, it's now back in normal user mode? Uh, does it have to have a different mode once, once I've, uh, I've sealed it up? And do you provide the ability to do uh, the equivalent of the uh, clear and reset to factory config? I know that we've been putting this in our platform, uh, but not everyone does provide that way to get that system back to the original factory condition. So still lots of things sort of churning around in the key management and the setup mode. Um, you know, this is all sort of just hitting out in the consumer space now, and we're going to see it in the enterprise space here with the advent of the next round of platforms. Dual booting of Windows 8 and Linux with, uh, with U UEFI Secure Boot enabled. Um, so there's some great uh, videos. Uh, from uh, Intel, based on Intel reference specifications, you can go out and you can watch how someone has enabled Windows 8 and Linux uh, dual booting securely on uh, the UEFI uh, secure boot enabled platform. Uh, but the user interfaces vary from system to system, as we've said. Um, I know that Dong has collected up all the instructions on HP Elite Books and ProBook laptops, and he'll be here Wednesday. So if you have one of those, you can button hook him or send him an email, uh, and he can walk you through the steps of everything that he's been doing. I would think it's his secret, uh, it's his secret plan to get one of every HP personal system device with the excuse of, you know, he needs to be able to test this. So he's got quite an assemblage of HP personal devices in his cubes, all, all do booting back and forth. UEFI for 
32-bit x86. This is something that's a little bit different, um, and it's kind of popped up, uh, and uh, it's a little bit of a problem, uh, a little challenge here for the Linux community. Right now, UEFI and Linux is supporting 64-bit, and there isn't a 32-bit implementation. But what's happened is that the 32-bit um, x86 has been popping back up in a couple of interesting uh, environments. Now, most of them are, are like closed uh, small devices, tablets or wearables or embedded. Uh, but when we originally started on the UEFI journey, we had, um, we had three, four classes of machine. Class zero was pure legacy BIOS. Class one was uh, a compatibility layer only over BIOS. Class two was UEFI underneath with a compatibility layer that you could fall back on. And class three was UEFI only. And what's interesting about these, uh, these new devices is people just want to say, I want to have an x86 32-bit because I have an edited device, or I want to save the power, or I want to save the, the space on my die. I'm not going to have that much memory. For whatever reason, they've been trolling around in the 32-bit x86 environment. They've also said, I don't want to have any BIOS. I don't want to have that legacy environment all, at all. So I want to jump all the way out here to a class three device. Uh, an example uh, here for us uh, were HP's Elite Pad and their NVX2 um, personal devices. Uh, and they had their own reasons that they chose a 32-bit x86 for those. But they also implemented uh, a class three UEFI. Um, so you know, there's, as it says here, you know, unfortunately, um, these are uh, all almost all closed systems. Uh, so the, we don't have to worry about supporting uh, UEFI option ROMs for I/O cards because there are no any I/O slots. These are all just you know sealed up devices. Uh, in order for the uh, for operating systems to work on this, they have to support UEFI uh, for 32-bit uh, x86 to be able to run on these devices. Um, it's confusing because traditional, PS, for traditional PCs, uh, all the operating systems have only been supporting 64-bit UEFI. Uh, for these closed systems, though, Android and Windows 8 do support um, UEFI for 32-bit x86. Um, so it's just a, it's just a strange, uh, strange thing right now, but it's one of these things where they sort of picked one thing from the past and one thing from the future and welded it together. Uh, and so as far as being able to grab one of these devices and repurpose it with Linux, it's going to be a little bit of a challenge for you. So the call to action. The first call to action is participate. Uh, so we have UEFI forum uh, membership is available. Uh, it's available uh, at, um, at the corporate level. It's available uh, for individuals as well. Um, now, the specifications uh, and everything, of course, is, are all available uh, as well, and then uh, certainly the tests as well. Um, open source contributions, we have pianocore.org and Lenaro as two open source uh, communities that you can collaborate with, uh, and you can help improve the user experience. Uh, you know, and again, this is where I would certainly invite people. Uh, we'll, have the, we'll have here the plug fest, but, you know, just... Uh, if you see something with a poor UEFI inf inter interface that doesn't support multi-boot very well, I've seen some implementations where they would only have, you'd say, yeah, we support multi-boot, but they only show one boot entry at a time. And the first one is taken up by Windows. Uh, so it's like, well, yeah, you sort of do it. And then I recall them saying, well, then you need to execute this shell command. And it reminded me of the old boot kind of pass we had to do on HUXPA RISC systems back in 1995, where if you didn't know the exact incantation of boot path things to enter in this, it wasn't going to work. And that's, that's not friendly. Uh, and so we made sure we gave some feedback there. Um, and supporting user-friendly UEFI secure boot management user interfaces. How do I get from user mode to setup mode? How do I get back? How do I enroll a key? How do I de-enroll a key? How do I wipe back to, in, to factory refresh? Um, those are all things that, um, again, you'll often find those are on the less pretty screens because they're the, the, not the ones that um, people are expecting to be used a lot. 
But if you need to use them and they're not adequate, then you really do need to let everyone know that and uh, make sure that we get those continuous improvements into those. And the, the best way to do that is to try it out and complain if it doesn't work. So with that, um, we'll flip open to some questions, although I will admit that I might point you at uh, Ed Dong when he gets here on, on Wednesday for more technical questions, uh, since I'm, I'm filling in for him to some degree today. Uh, but we'll, we'll open it up. And, and please do use the microphone because they're recording the sessions. We want to make sure everyone can hear you uh, on the tape. Uh, do you know a real explanation why a UFI secure boot could, could be uh, disabled on uh, uh, x86 uh, platforms, but it couldn't be disabled on uh, ARM platforms? I don't know why. I'm sorry, I, did, I didn't understand the question. Uh, could you uh, explain why secure boot mode could be disabled on x86 uh, platforms, but it couldn't be dis disabled on ARM platforms? So that, so if you're talking about like the Microsoft products, that was an implementation decision by the, the implementers. There's nothing in the specifications that says you should or should not have it. It's an, secure boot is an optional feature in the, in the UEFI specifications. Uh, now, in the case of Microsoft, they have decided on their general purpose uh, x86 platform uh, specification to say that you need to include a switch to have it off. They decided not to include that requirement in their, uh, in their ARM product. There's nothing about the specifications that says you should or you should, shouldn't have it. It says, if you implement secure boot, here's the specification for secure boot, but it is an optional feature. Okay, thank you. Early in one of your slides, you talked about differentiation. Okay. Earlier, you talked about differentiation and you gave examples of the, the GUI tools. Mm -hmm. So I only care about servers. And historically, one of the problems we had with server vendors was either a focus on Windows features or a focus on GUIs. And that they tried to transport that into the server world where we want headless servers. Mm -hmm. And so the examples you gave heightened my fears because that's exactly the thing you don't want is that type of approach. And if you're in the business of selling servers, you're sending the wrong message to people who care about servers. So differentiation for us has always meant bloat and lack of control of the underlying platform. And the examples you gave drive that point, ho point home. We'd like to just jump into the Lin Linux as early as possible. And we don't want differentiation. We want a common set of Bias. It's just like we do install Linux and it doesn't really matter what the hardware is. We'd like a common firmware experience and it shouldn't matter who the vendor is. But this opens the door for more pain for us in the future. How are you going to address that? So I think I, what I would say is that the specific, you are correct. I mean, differentiation is layered on top of the standard specifications. However, I think by standardizing things like the shell, we do provide you with those ubiquitous, low-level, non-human interface-driven uh, uh, capabilities uh, to interface and to interact with the system. Uh, I think it, it does provide you uh, easier ways to get your payloads installed on the platforms and running as quickly as possible. You know, the fact that we can have the UFI utilities uh, that you can write once and then pr uh, then put out onto any platform. The fact that we've added, we're adding things like the asynchronous I.O., allowing you to have a richer set of UEFI uh, utilities is going to be an interesting thing for you as an enterprise server uh, focused user of UEFI based platforms. So I think don't, don't worry about the eye candy. It's, you know, it's there for personal systems. Uh, to help uh, them with configuration and the like, but as far as you know, where did UEFI have its genesis? On big iron, titanium, and now x86 hardware. So I think it's, it was designed and conceived by enterprise architects for that environment. The fact that it can be extended down to the personal systems and add these kinds of features, I think, is just a testament to 
the flexibility that those original shapers had in designing a platform that could span from laser jets all the way through Superdome. Don't worry. With the secure boot, you're allowing changing of the keys. Haven't you just opened the door to hackers? So the, you, you can open the system. You can disable secure boot and then not have it. Now, if you're talking about then turning it back on and using it in a secure manner, then you do, if you've signed with the keys and the, you have the platform key and you have secure boot turned on, then you're still validating against the keys that were put in there. Now, if someone has physical access to the system, then they can do whatever they want to it. Um, so I don't think that there's a difference in the platform because the operating system code is going to be checking down, uh, and it will check this. So if you have the full chain there, then there's not a way for you to come in and put in a different key We can have a discussion, and we can get Don to, to explain it to you. But I think the, the bottom line is we want these people to have the flexibility. If you're using the proprietary stack that's been buttoned up from top to bottom, then you can do that. If you want to turn it all off, you can do that. If you want to generate your own keys and the layers above, then you can do that. The specifications are just there as a way to provide a standard implementation of those mechanisms. So as you uh, mentioned with the propagation of secure boot into enterprise um, and then the comment of no known circumventions yet of secure, bo secure boot if it's properly implemented, what steps are being taken maybe by the UEFI group to have a set of tests to ensure that you've properly Im implemented secure boot or if you just happen to have bugs, is it on the vendor that gets screwed up and then has their stuff compromised. So how are you making sure that that's going to be secure, booting secure boot? I think that's one of those questions I'm going to have to toss to Dong and see what he's doing in the security working group uh, as far and also how they work with the testing working group. Uh, so he'll be here on Wednesday or you can email him or, or I can you pass on to me and I'll get it to him and see where he is on, on driving those uh, discussions and extending the extending the testing. I think part of this also is just, you know, it's also new. Uh, and I know some of the things that came out um, at like the Black Hat uh, not too long ago were some of the examples here where that was, um, you know, examples of, of poor implementation uh, that is one of those things that until you get out there and get, getting the, you know, security experts really probing uh, these things, it, it's, you're going to take some time to ferret out all the vulnerabilities that you've created. Uh, with uh, implementation decisions. I think it's quite useful to agree on our terminology. What we've talked a lot about differentiation or value add. I'm not quite sure how many pe people realize that most people will call that value subtract. We're talking about excuses for common features, common user requirements to be gratuitously different gratuitously absent or broken, rather than just implemented once in each gate two, everybody uses the same thing. Is there any prospect of maybe starting to improve on that? You know, this is always a, a challenge in, in standardization, and I've been in many different kinds of standards bodies, and uh, everyone wants to standardize as much as they have to and no more. I mean, that's just, that's, that's in the end, they want a reason for you to choose their something over someone else's something. A and this is one of the ways eye candy and, and features that are rich in this, in this manner is one way for people to be able to differentiate themselves. You may not appreciate it, but they do need to find some way of making themselves different. Oh, well, they manage that. They are very different, and that makes the users the same, which is why we call it value subtract. There is a disconnect there. And 
I would certainly encourage you to make them make that known. If you don't like it, then that's the best thing. And the great thing about amplification of our opinions through social media is that it's more powerful when we can share that feedback and have it be amplified. And then, and hopefully, if you know, if you don't like it, and you get enough people who agree with you, then that can resonate. Uh, so I think that's certainly an opportunity. But you know, this is. Just the general nature of standards bodies, you will standardize to a certain level, and then you all sort of take one step back and think about, okay, we're all going to be at this level. Uh, how are we all going to be a little bit different at the next level? And uh, I can appreciate your sentiment, uh, but it's going to be difficult to convince people not to try and be better than the other guy. In whatever way they measure that is, is certainly another implementation <coughs> detail. I have a question about the Piano Core reference implementation. Mm -hmm. uh, when new features are added to the spec and then implemented in the reference implementation, uh, to what degree do different vendors pull from the Piano Core implementation into their uh, respective uh, distributions? I'm sorry, there was noise coming in from the door there. I okay, so our, um, uh, is the reference implementation pulled into the respective OEMs implementations oh, okay. of UEFI? Uh, some of them do. Some of them pull the reference code and send it out. Um, it just depends on the individual OEM. Do they pull pieces of the reference code? Do they pull the entire thing? Uh, we certainly have many, many engineers working on, um, on UEFI modules for our, our implementation that's a little bit different. It also depends upon what architecture you're pulling from and whether or not you know, they, they pull entirely of pianocore.org uh, or they just pull pieces. So it varies from uh, it varies from OEM to OEM. How much of the channel core they pull, uh, where they pull everything, and then how much they add in above that. So it we will definitely vary from OEM to OEM. One last question. Thank you very much. Have a good conference. <laughs>